Well, good morning, y'all. Glad to have everybody with, with us. I know some of you probably swam here or, or canoed in, and um, some of you who probably couldn't get in are online with us now, and we uh, appreciate y'all being with us as we worship and get around the Word. We also, um, uh, yes, are praying for our country and praying for what's uh, what lies ahead, and, um, and I love, you know, David, as David prayed, uh, just the reminder that uh, we know that God is the one who puts everyone in authority, but also, too, that God's the one who's in charge, and that he, everything is going precisely according to his plan and his design, and it has been this way ever since time began. So we have so much to be grateful for, so much to be thankful for, so also, too, that just the facts on our side, you know, that Christ, he, uh, he came just when he said he was going to. He, he died on a cross for our sins, just like he said he was going to. And he rose again, just like he said he was going to. And uh, this sounds a whole lot like 1 Corinthians 15, you know, according to the scriptures, just like he said he would. And he's coming back again, just like he said he would. Uh, so, yeah, it's all, it's all great news. Uh, we have the best news, so we have to live like it, and like he could come back at any moment. And but we're also, as we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper here in a moment, it's a, to that that reminder that we have all the time of what He did for us. But also, too, just hey, there's there's sin still in our hearts and our minds and our lives that we need to confess. And as we sang that song we just sang that Cliff wrote, by the way, um, that that we are we're asking for continual forgiveness. Not that we need, it, need to be for, forgiven over and over again. He's already done that. But he wants us to come to us as children, lay our hearts before him and say, God, we need you. Forgive us what we've turned against you. And we want to grow closer to you. We want to be more like you, just like uh, a child does to um, his father. But uh, we're going to be in Romans 1 today as we get ready for communion. And we're just going to look at two verses, Lord willing. I say that, Lord willing. Um, in verses 24 and 25. And it's still we're, what we're asking the question here is, why is the world the way it is? You ever wonder why the world is the way it is? It's pretty, I mean, all the time is, is more and more messed up, right? There's something that's always happened. This, this past week, uh, many of those in my generation had an event that we knew would eventually come, but just earth shattering. I remember as a sixth grader uh, sitting in Miss Eubanks' class, and we had these, these odd things called right? They don't get books now. They get Chromebooks, right? But we had these things called books. And what the, the best, you know, the, the, the best thing to do at the beginning of the year was you had to get a paper bag that they used to put groceries in, right? Remember those paper bags? And we would cut up the paper bag and we'd take our textbooks and you, you Gen Xers know what I'm talking about. And, and I mean, it was like, this was like what it, your story was, like on Instagram or whatever Instaface before then. Like you, your life was on that on that book cover that you made from a cardboard or you know paper bag. And inevitably, if you were a fifth or sixth grade boy in the South, you were you were you were doing your best to draw you a Van Halen <laughs> logo, right? Because. I mean, that was back in the day, man. That was like, you know, I was a bet, you know, you, you were buying 1984, you know? Yeah, Eddie Van Halen died. I mean, we, we, we had to have like a staff meeting for like an hour this week when, when the news came out, and we were like, instant argument over who's the best guitarist of all time, you know? But, um, but it, you know, took me back, all that kind of, kind of stuff, but it reminded me too of, of a lot of what we see today is that, and he was called a, the, a rock god, you know? And, and that's how people held him up there. And yeah, we did. I mean, back in the day, we did. And my, you know, my, my kids too, like, hey, Eddie Van Halen died, Dad. You know? um, they texted me like, like 10 minutes after. Um, it, it's for so many today, people look up to people who are celebrities. Or, I mean, he was an amazing guitarist. He was, they call him the Mozart of, of guitar. Um, but... It reminded me too of what we see here in this pa in this passage, that people have a tendency when God is out of the picture to substitute. I mean, we were going to do eruption this day. I'm just going to call Michael and say, "Man, you got to do eruption for us this morning." Yeah, you know, as a solo. Um, 
He would do it too. But I, I know I've lost a lot of you. I'm sorry. But, but we do have this tendency in us to, if, if God is out of the picture, to replace God with something else. And he, he tells you, hey, it's going to start with a man. It's going to be a, a vision of a man and it'll quickly go down to something else. And usually it's something in the form of animals and eventually reptiles or whatever. And if you study uh, history and you study religions of ancient, ancient civilizations of the past, you see it all. You just look at any ancient civilization in Egypt or Babylon or any other places and that's exactly what they did. They worshiped people, they worshiped animals, and held them up into this almost their own Godhead pantheon type thing. And if we're not careful, our, in our own hearts, we'll do the same thing. But this is exactly what we're seeing around us. We're asking the question why is the world the way it is? We're, we just can't, we gotta stop blaming it on 2020. You know, as if. You know, that's something. What, what we see, this is a terrifying passage. I mean, I, I've had the, the hardest time preparing for these messages just because it is a terrifying passage. It's, and it's, I mean, most theologians passion. this is the one that just, it just gets you because you see this same pattern happening over and over and over again. Throughout history, you see it happen in families. You see it even happen in churches. You see it happen in individuals. That there's, and it, it's, it repeats itself. You see it over and over again. And you have different governments and you have different people and thinking, hey, we, we can do it better. The other ones who had it wrong, well, they, they started off well. They just didn't finish it out well. We can do it better. As if. No, God has, if you want to call it a formula, you can, but God has an exact design on how we're to live to operate, we are made for his glory. This is we just sang just a second ago. So I want us to read, we're going to read just verses 24 and 25. And because this is going to take a while, several weeks for us to go into. Next week's going to be hard, especially you. I'm just going to give you the, you know, if you're thinking about why you know, the society is where it, where it is on, on issues such as marriage, on issues such as transgenderism, on issues, of course, homosexuality and just just in the view of sexuality in general, that's going to be next week. We've talked about this before, but it's such an issue that between that and the issue of abortion that, that the rest of the world is going to come after Christians about, okay? So just, just know that. We're going to be doing that next week, not so much today. But let's begin in verse 24. I'm going to ask you to stand with me uh, just for these two verses, and we'll pray together. Therefore... God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Father, thank you that we can come to you by faith in Jesus that, Lord, as we stand here prepared to hear your word and also to take of the of the cup and of the bread in just a moment, that your word is so good. It's like, it's, it's water to us. It's like uh, food. It's like honey. It's like all the other things that your word says that replenishes us and feeds us and makes us stronger. And with that, Lord, we remember that if we confess our sins, that you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and it cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And what we do is as individually, as the church family, we ask your forgiveness for where we have turned away from you. And God, we ask that you would continue to grow us. Thank you that our sins are forgiven past, present, and future. But we're just saying together this morning, uh, together gathered here and also those who are online this morning, that we want to know you more. We want to know you better. We want to grow closer to you each and every single day beginning right now. We love you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So we're asking this question, does, does, does God have the right to tell us no? To, why is the world the way it is? And what we fail to see is what God gives us every single day. 
I think sometimes we're so focused on the, the, the bad things, you know, I mean, it's just like a, you know, a athletic competition. People will so focus on one particular bad play, right? Say a, a, a bad snap that goes over somebody's head, right? If you were watching yesterday. They'll miss the whole, whole, the whole big game, right? We, we are so focused, I think, sometimes we, um, I'm speaking as a society, that we, f- we fail to see what God's done, what God has given us every single day. He has given something to us. We get, I mean, we get a single breath every day. He gives us food. He gives us all these things. So what has he given us? First off, in verse 24, the beginning there, he just says, therefore. He's talking about everything that's happened before, but what, what he's talking about is how God gives everyone something. He's given us everyone an opportunity. And we have opportunity all the time. It's, it's what we've been focusing on these, these verses b- beforehand. It's the why of God's wrath. God's, God's showing his wrath, and that wrath is, is something he's pouring out at one point in the future. But everybody sees this evidence. He's given this evidence to people all, all the time. And people either choose to receive this evidence or not. So that's, that's the first thing I want you to see. God gives, us ev- gives, gives everyone opportunity. And so the logic here is clear. First off, people in verses 18 through 20, they neglect the truth. They choose to turn their back on the truth. Then the speculation, as they've suppressed it and they just said, whatever, this general revelation of God, this neglect of the truth, leads next to speculation and confusion. We talked about this last week, that the mind is what gets messed up. So if people just, if they begin to suppress the truth and push it away or neglect it, then what your brain, you know what, your, your brain needs truth, right? Right, teachers? We want our kids to know the truth because they can't pass the test. And the same thing's true with God. It, it gives us information all the time that's truth. And what we've done is said, no, we don't want it. So that messes up the brain and that fuzzy thinking there. And so verse 22 tells us because the, the, we got the fuzzy thinking and the brain's messed up, we're at least a blindness. In, in, in other words, as it says that we, people became, uh, verse 22, if you see that, profess to be wise, they became fools. And the, it says also too, their hearts are darkened. So it's not just the brain, then it goes to the heart and people become numb. Their emotions become numb. I think, you know, we're seeing that all the time. People just, if you're questioning, why, why do people think they just have the right just to go in and, and tear up somebody's property or to kill someone and, and just be so numb to it? Well, they suppress the truth. Their, their brain has gotten fuzzy. They're, uh, they become blind. And then they become uh, blind fools. And then they become, in verse 23, they become more and more isolated. They exchange the truth of God and they, they get away from God. So now they're isolated. God is not in the picture. And then verse 23, it, it's, they be, begin to worship, exchanging the, the glory of God for an image in the form. These, these are idols. These are man-centered. These are things also that turns into worship of just ordinary creatures. You see, God's given everybody opportunity. There's no escape clause for anybody, no excuses for anyone. So I just, again, ask the question, you know, the, the main point here is that God gives everyone opportunity. So not everyone has opportunity to hear specifically about the truth about Jesus. Yes. But everybody has the opportunity to see what God has made and say, there is, a, there, there, there is an order to everything in this creation. Then the fact that there's an order, there has to be someone who has put into place a designer and a creator. God gave his son for us in John three sixteen. Not everybody hears that. Not everybody sees that because somebody has to go and tell them. We'll talk about that when we get to Romans 10. But nobody is without excuse in the sense of knowing there's God. That's why you got to follow. If you, if you read this passage, you follow Paul and you look at him, he has a purpose in life that he is so laser focused on. Acts 20, 24, he said, 
I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race, complete the task the Lord Jesus has given to me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. If you follow, if you track with, with Paul, he is laser focused on this because of what he said here. People are, are not without excuse. They see it everywhere around them. And the only way out, I mean, that, that information is only enough to condemn them. The only way out is if they hear about Jesus. The only way of salvation is that they hear about Jesus. So I'm going, is what Paul is saying. He was, if you look at verse 15, he was eager to preach the gospel. Why? Because he was not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because he had this specific revelation. You've got everybody seeing this. Not everybody sees the truth about Jesus. I'm going. And this is a, a righteousness that's received by faith there in verse 17. And why do we need God's righteousness? It's the only power that lifts us as, as we've talked through all these steps out of this downward spiral. All those steps that we've gone through in those verses in 18 to 23 is a downward spiral that man goes through, that man has done time and time and time again. So the gospel is what people need, and it's the gospel is what we have. That's why we are called to go and share the truth. Is that all right? Of course it's all right. But we got to live that way. And here's the deal. People become like whatever they worship. That's what, you know, idols are cold and they're hard and they don't talk. Unresponsive. That's what eventually happens to people. But when you worship Jesus, if you turn to him by faith, repent of your sin, turn to him by faith, what, you know what happens? You're still the old prickly pear that you were when you first became a Christian, Right? But you may, you know, you're, you're going to start this journey of being changed, becoming more like Christ. I mean, you see it all, people get, they get saved and they've got bad habits in their life, you know, they drink too much or they use bad language or whatever, they're smoking or chewing tobacco, whatever. Eventually over, or they, you know, they begin to, and they, the way they relate to people is not the best. They may not have been the most honest business person. But eventually those habits begin to be changed out with good habits. They begin to see people as made in God's image and not as something in the way. This is what happens when you begin to worship Jesus. Is that you become less like your former, former idols and become more like him. Just, it, did that sound a whole lot better? So... This is all the why. This is the why people turn to idols. This is the why of God's wrath. Why is this being shown? Now he's going to turn you to the how. Like, how is this? All right, so I, I get the big, big idea, but then practically, how is this going to work out? So this is my second main point here, is that God gives rebellious man over to himself. God gives rebellious man over to himself. That this is the how in verse 24 as it begins here. God gave them over the lust of their hearts to impurity. These are the natural consequences of verses 18 through 23. You see, you know, what's the worst situation? If you're on a, any kind of sports team or you're in a classroom, you know what the worst situation is? Maybe you've got a coach or you've got a teacher that has just been giving you the worst time up and down the road. You know what the worst situation is? It's not that they make you run laps. It's not that they make you stay after class and do it over again. You know what the worst is? It's when they leave you alone. It's when they stop yelling. It's when they say, okay, have it your way. That is the worst. God, at some point, will say to a person or to a people, have it your way. Fine. It, his love never ceases, right? The opportunity remains. But people, I mean, here, this is not rocket science. People do what they want. 
Y'all aren't writing that down. Why aren't you writing that down? Like, oh, that is such, that's huge. You know, people do exactly what they want. And if you're a believer in Christ, like you, you do what you want because God changes out your bad desires with his new desires. To know him, to enjoy him, to share him, to be who God made you to be. But the, the worst, the trap, is when God says, fine, have it your way. And the prayer on, on God's part is, is, well, perhaps they'll wake up and come to their senses, just like if you think about Luke 15, when the prodigal son, the, the father said, fine, go, go your way. And perhaps when the worst gets the worst, you'll, you'll open up your eyes and see. What is happening here is that this terrifying phrase, we're going to see it three times in this passage, is when God, it's, it's in other places called abandoning, but it's when God gives them over. It's a terrifying Greek word, uh, paradidomai. Um, it's, it's used in other, other places to describe when somebody gives their body to be burned. It's, it's used also in 2 Peter 2, 4, when uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the fallen angels are cast, they, they cast themselves down. And here is three times, verse 24, 26, and 28. We'll, we'll cover those later, but it's, it's, it's to express this corrupt lifestyle and it's really God's sentence, have it your way. And KJV is God gave them up. Uh, William Barclay, when he was going through this, rendered it, God abandoned them. J.B. Phillips, whenever he was writing his paraphrase for his kids to help his kids one day understand this, is they gave up God, so God gave them up. I don't know if y'all heard that. They gave up God, so God gave them up. It's a very strong word. It's how God, how he hands over the human race for judgment because of their sins. And what's going on here is that God actually, what he's doing here, he's actually avenging himself by allowing that downward spiral of decline of evil men and women. He's avenging his own name. Why? We forget that there's several words that's used in this passage, but uh, everybody, real quick, I'm, I'm, Stay with me. Creator, say that word. Creator. Creature, say that word. Creature. Which one are we? We're the creature. I, I think mankind think, has kind of elevated himself, especially with the advent and the invention of this thought system called evolution, that we can evolve into gods. We can evolve into creators. And it's a lie from the pit. It's the same thing. It's the same lie that, that Satan had. When he said, I will, I will, I will, I can take over. No, we can't because we are, no matter what we want to say it, and we can repeat it to ourselves how many times we want to, we're still the creature. He's the creator. So he, he avenging himself, he has taken responsibility for his creation. It's a, it's, and this whole God giving them over, the idea here too as well is, uh, this my, I married into a family of farmers, although I, 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 I arch one, right? My, my wife's family had hog farmers on one side and dairy farmers on the other side. And, uh, but one phrase I heard constantly was, and this is usually in, in regards to children, but if you give a calf enough rope, he will eventually hang himself. Anybody ever heard that before? If you give a calf enough rope, He'll eventually hang himself. And it's just that, hey, I'm just going to keep you going, keep you going, keep you going, and eventually it's going to come back. I mean, these kids heard it their whole life, you know. It's, all, it's also the idea of, you know, if, when we say the phrase, left to our own devices. I tried to find out where that little phrase came from. I still can't find it. But when people are left to their own devices, I think we all know what that means. Kent Hughes said this way, this, this, uh, thinking of this next step down and giving this calf enough rope. Men and women have slipped to such depths that it would disgrace animals to have such conduct among them. God's wrath is all around us, and it seems that more wrath 
you know, people giving into sin is falling daily. And how is it seen? It talks about impurity here and this, this idea of, 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 uh, of sex or outside of marriage is also translated uncleanness. That sex within marriage is a gift from God. I mean, God, God gave it, yeah, for procreation and all this great stuff, but it's also given as a gift between husband and wife. And what, what happens is, is they dishonor their own bodies by using it contrary to the way God intended. There, it's, and this, is just, this, this goes a whole lot more deeper than it does just the lust of flesh. This is about the spirit. This is about the heart. But when you see this, as, we, as we'll see in the, in the verses that comes after this, it just, it just it goes to another step down and another step down and another step down. But don't make any mistake about it that what's happening when you're seeing that in a person or you're seeing that in a society, and when you see just rampant sexual immorality, inventions of immorality, what you're seeing is, is God saying, have more rope. Have more rope. Have it your way. Is the is the the coach saying, "All right, you do what you you do what you want." Is the teacher saying, "I've done everything I can do." That's what we're seeing in our world today. And the the great news, the good news, as long as there's Christians here, living out the Christian life, holding you know holding our government and holding each other accountable saying this is the truth, walk in it, we got a chance. This, this state, this world has a chance because we have, not that we're, you know, all that, because we know, just like Paul said, we're the chief of sinners. I mean, yeah, I, I, there's nothing in this passage that not one of us is, is, should, fall in, should not fall under conviction for. But this world has a chance as long as we're here, as long as we're sharing the truth, as long as we're living out the Christian life. You're, you're the only hope that some people are ever going to see. You're, you're the only Jesus that somebody's ever going to come in contact with. Why? Because people are now even more isolated thanks to the coronavirus era. They're, they're, more, they're more and more not paying attention to the truth. They're less and less around us. That's why we've got to go. We've got to take opportunities to share the gospel with them. So God's right wrath is in process. But don't don't mistake, I would say if you're watching or if you're here today, that don't mistake that judgment that's not befalling us right now is an approval from God for our behavior. In other words, hey, there's nothing bad happening to me, so I must be okay. You know, it's, that's just going to be, we're going to get in heaven one day and find out why so many, you know, godly, quote, good people had so many problems, were afflicted so much, and then the most wicked folks were over and over blessed like crazy financially and their families and everything else. There's a story of a farmer who was an unbeliever and, an, and just not just an unbeliever, he was antagonistic against Christianity, against the church, and he owned a piece of land right next to a local church, and it was his pleasure every Sunday morning to, to bring the tractor out and just burn all, all during worship service, right? Mar and I used to be a part of a church and, and Augusta that the train ran right beside the church. And we were just used to it, but still, you know, right in the middle of the preacher preaching, you know. And he, would, he was always very nice. And he was slight eye roll, you know. But this, 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 this pastor put up with this from this farmer all the time. And so, you know, one, one year spring came and the corn sprouted by July 4th, it was about knee high, and there was plenty of rain, and he, and the, and by the time harvest came around, it was high, and he, I mean, he had a huge harvest, made a whole lot of money, and so the farmer goes to the pastor and, and said, well, it's, it's obvious that God doesn't exist, because look how much I'm blessed. And the pastor wrote back and said to him, God doesn't sell his accounts just in October. <laughs> so y'all, <laughs> just because the bill doesn't come due now doesn't mean the bill won't come due at all. 
It always comes to. So God gives rebellious man over to himself. God says, have it your way. Don't, mis- don't mistake present blessing for God saying, okay. Thirdly here, God gives the truth which man replaces. You see it there, verse 25. He exchanged the truth of God for a lie, this whole exchange. We, we keep talking about how Christ has exchanged his righteousness to us for our sin, but there's also what people do every single day, and it's just that the false perversion of that is they take God's truth and they, and they, they put it to the side and exchange it for a lie, and it's man's refusal to acknowledge and glorify God. Again, we've said this before that we are natural born worshipers. Men and women will worship something. If you remove God out of the picture, we will find something to worship. And you may be listening today, one of our unsaved friends that are watching or, or gathered here right now, and you may say, well, I don't have an idol. It's not like a little statue of my house that I, you know, you know, I, I give incense to or anything like that. You don't, it's not that, we're a lot more technologically advanced now in our idolatry. We have, we have screens. That whatever, we pour, whatever we pour our hearts, our minds, and money and attention into, that is what we serve. Because a human being by nature will worship something. And again, we become like the gods we worship. C.B. Cranfield said this way, in the end, their humanism, our man-centeredness, resulted in the dehumanization of each other. See, we, we, we even label our idolatry with updated terms so that we feel better. That idolatry became, our man-centeredness turned into humanism. In the end, Hugh said this as well, man lowers himself to a condition below God's created purpose. The truth is truth. The truth of God is, is not the, only the truth concerning God, but also God's truth concerning all things, including us. And really, what this translates into, when it speaks of the truth, it's exchanged for a lie. It's the, really, in the Greek, it's the lie. It's literally the lie. And you know, the angels who fell did this. They exchanged the truth for a lie or the lie. We cannot exist independent from God. And mankind made himself his own God in place of the true God. And that's, that's what's happening to our culture today. That we have made ourselves gods. I mean... Hey, I don't do this. Yes, we do it all the time. And we got to see ourselves in light of the, the last point here I want us to see, the God who gave himself. When we, when we look upon the Lord and we see who he is, is this, the creator who is blessed forever, amen. I mean, Paul kind of ends here with a, let me, let me stop here for a second and let's just praise the Lord for a second. Let's, let's just, he, he is blessed forever. He's our creator. He is El Shaddai. He is the one who has made us. He's forever praised. And he, he, he even adds an amen there. It's an affirmation. So as we're going to stop here in just a moment and take the Lord's Supper, I want you to think about how God, the God who gave himself and he's eternally worthy. That in this passage in Romans 1, you, you remember there in you know, verse 17 the, about the righteousness of God. And it's replaced with the wrath of God. Now, how did that happen? If you go back, remember, if you go back in your, in your Bibles, you look in the Gospel of John or Matthew, that when John, uh, Jesus gave his uh, mother to John for John to look after her. Right after that, darkness fell on the earth from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. Now, what was going on there? Was it, was it just the, the, the hideous physical, you know, having his, his hands pierced through, having his side pierced, his head just uh, is completely bloodied by the beatings, but also by the crown of thorns or the, his feet being, was it just, wow, this is terrible. He, he is getting a physical beating. Well, if you compare his crucifixion with other recordings of crucifixions, 
it was not as long and as terrible, just a physical torture of it, as many, I mean, sometimes it lasts for days. We're talking three hours on the cross. No, it wasn't the physical beatings that he endured. It was the agony of becoming sin for us. It was, and, and Jewish thinking was, that cursed is every man who hangs on a tree. You see, Jesus bore our sins. He became a curse, as Galatians 3.13. He became the curse, the wrath of God for you and I. It's at that moment of separation, the pain from the nails was nothing to Jesus. It was not the flayed back being spread open. There is no experience so painful as separation from God. That is why Jesus cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because he became my sin and your sin. Everyone who would believe when he suffered on the cross alone, utterly alone, for the first time ever, he was the, the third person or the second person of the Godhead was separated from his father. It had never happened in all of time memorial. Something that we would think would be completely impossible happened because Jesus became sin, my sin, your sin, all of our sin for that moment in time. That on the cross, Jesus took the wrath that was ours and took it in our place. That's why we should love him even more. And that's why we should have our hearts changed even more when we surrender our hearts to him and let go of our idols. Martin Luther said, whatever your heart clings to and relies on is God. Today, this is, this is a moment here for believers that there may be a, hey, is there something that's written on the story of your life, on the book cover of your life, that mm, this may be an idol? You need to cast that down because Jesus became the, the curse for you on a tree. Maybe something's crept in after a while. Maybe there's sin in your heart, in your life, that you see evidence of, of this lustful trend that you see here in Romans chapter one and maybe you see it in your own heart and mind. And maybe, hey, you're confessed up, you're just ready to see Jesus as just any time would be great, you know? Remember 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 11, God's not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation. That's your destiny. For every single believer here today, your destiny is to, is, is, as, as you've already received Jesus as Lord and Savior, to enjoy him forever. But it's also now your job to go share with everyone, everyone you meet. We're going to partake of this Lord's Supper here in a moment. We're going to have someone come and play for us. And this, several purposes here. Yeah, this is for everyone to say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm giving my heart to the Lord today once again, afresh and new. Of course, we're doing this differently because uh, of living in the COVID area, era. Uh, you'll have a, um, a deacon bring it to you, um, and we have it in separate little containers. Uh, but I just ask for you to prepare your heart, get before the Lord, um, and as uh, we sing together, just allow him to speak to you and work in you. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's close our hearts in prayer. Father, we just come to you and thank you for the God who saves, the God who gave us his own son on the cross so that we could have everlasting eternal life. Jesus, we, um, we just thank you again. And we ask that if there's any sin in our own hearts that we confess that and get that right with you right now, that Lord, um, if there's anything we need to get right with one another, that we would go to our brother or sister in Christ and, and um, be reconciled to each other. Um, and Lord, just thank you again that you stand ready to forgive. You stand ready with open arms. And uh, we just, we run to you like children. And we love you. Lord, uh, speak to us now. Help us to remember what you did for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As our deacons go forward.